Good evening. I'd uh, like to thank a few people before we start. I'd like to thank uh, Linda Brown, Andrew McKenzie, Daniel Clift, Tom Trevor, Jeremy Ackerman, and Miroslav Razjek for uh, making the exhibition uh, possible. I'd like to uh, thank Hanele Grunland for her wonderful design. I'd like to thank Pamela Johnson for her translation and editing of the publication, and uh, Peter Hatzel and Melanie Kroller for their design and production of the uh, publication. I'd also like to thank uh, Peter Zumthor for agreeing to uh, uh, the exhibition, to the publication, and working with us under incredibly uh, tight timetable uh, uh, structures and uh, to really making everything possible in terms of the, the both the uh, exhibition and the publication. I'm not really going to say too much about uh, Peter Zumthor. What I have to say is uh, in the preface of the book, and uh, you have to buy the book to, uh, <laughs> to read what I think. So uh, what I would like to say uh, is really a little bit about the people who are part of the community of Vals uh, in Switzerland and their faith in architecture and in the work of Peter Zumthor to actually, in a sense, make this thermal bath project possible. I was fortunate to uh, visit this project, um, when was it, about a couple of months ago, mm -hmm. two months ago, on a day when uh, uh, Peter was doing a, a site visit. And um, you have to appreciate the fact that this is, this is a project that is actually owned by the village and owned by the community and that the stones that are uh, used in the project are quarried very close by. And when, you, when Peter was having the site visit, in fact, the owner of the quarry, the quarryman, as well as the representatives of the community were present at this site visit. And you should have seen the joy on their, on their faces, in a sense, when they were going around the project where Peter was, in a sense, examining every aspect of it, but their sheer delight in the fact that it was possible. And I think, in a sense, I wish that in, in the UK there was also a little bit more of that kind of possibility that uh, our councilmen, so to speak, also believed a little bit more in and had a slightly greater faith in, in architecture and, uh, and, uh, and in architects, um, given what especially one or two of the things that have happened in the last news in the last couple of months. In any case, uh, without further ado, I would like you to join me in welcoming Peter Zomthor. Okay, am I <coughs> wired? I have to tell you the lecture is going to be held in German. <laughs> no. Maybe I have to tell you one thing uh, before I start with this presentation of this bath. I have never talked about a finished building. I sort of don't like this uh, walking up and down these slides, you know, saying, look at this and look at this and uh, explaining everything to you and say, look, this beautiful corner we made, this was really difficult to make and all this kind of stuff. Uh, because somehow I believe that once something is built, it's there, you know, and you can go and look at it. And it speaks for its own, and I, it's, I can only sort of like molest this stuff with my comments. I believe uh, that we do these things and then life takes place, you know. This, uh, this would be the my b uh, real, this is a real desire of mine, that these buildings become part of everyday life. Uh, nobody would sort of talk about them, you know. Maybe they hate them for five years, I know that, you know, or seven or eight years they sort of hate them. But after a while I always hope that they sort of like grow in and they become like a building I 
used to know when I grew up, when I was a boy, there were these buildings which just stayed in my mind. And they were, not, they were not special. There was nothing about these buildings. And only 20 or 30 years later, all of a sudden I think, hey, God damn, that's a good building. That must have been a good building, you know? And uh, sometimes I even ask, was this a good architect, you know? And sometimes you find out it actually was an architect. But sometimes you find out it wasn't an architect. <laughs> it was just an ordinary building nobody knows, you know, who made it anymore. So if I do this lecture kind of business, I have this one uh, detour, this way out. I talk about something which is not finished yet. Huh? So it's a little bit, I can show you now these slides of this bath. And for me, it's a little bit like working. As you know, if you explain something to somebody, you can hear whether you ring true or not. So that's what I'm going to do now. You know, I talk about it, and I hope I learn a little bit. And even now, yesterday when I was opening this nicely made catalog, you know, I was thinking when I some changes to be made. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyway, please show me the first two slides. This is where I come from. This is where we work. I hope they're still working at this time, huh? <laughs> <laughs> the next two. <laughs> From that place you just saw, when you take the car, drive up from a, an hour, upwards, Rhine, upwards, you come to this region where the River Rhine uh, or originates, where it springs. And this is the valley of Falls, this community here. It's actually an area where the people speak Romanche, or Romanche language, spoken only by 40,000 people. And Small villages, they speak German, an old kind of old fashioned, old, almost medieval kind of German, because they came over some passes from, an, from another region in Switzerland around 11 or 1200. And that's the way they still talk here, huh? And I can tell you they really know to talk directly and clearly. Next, please. Well, <laughs> so in the next slide soon, huh? You will see something. <laughs> Here you see the village of Falls. And in the next, please, the next. And the next ones. Okay. <laughs> Now, is this going to be the whole, huh? That's terrible. <laughs> That's terrible. Show the next one, please. Oh, it's only two, huh? Please go back. So, you're architects, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Use your imagination. This slide to the right there shows the complex in front of this old building. This complex replaces an old spa from 1900. It came in, this complex came into existence with German tax money because there was a law 20 years ago in Germany where you could uh, make these tax, how do you call it, redu reducements or something, if you invest in Switzerland. So this is part of my clientele. I have to deal with 200 people from Germany who invested in an apartment in this uh, complex here. <laughs> it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> so in the middle of this complex, there is a hot spring. And 20 years after this stuff was built, it went bankrupt. But in the meantime, 
there were about 200 place, labor places connected to this hotel. So the community of Fals bought this complex. What they could buy, they could only buy like the dining room and the kitchen and a couple of apartments because all the other apartments, they belong to single uh, owners from Germany. So for the last 10 years, they have been trying to buy these single apartments back in order to have some space of action up there. So they said in the middle of this, there has to be this thermal bath. And it has to be the most beautiful in Central Europe, they told me, you know. And they said, but you have to build it in a way that it can't be seen. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because there's this right, there's a right on the land that the German owners, when they look out their window towards the, the village, that they are not disturbed by any building. So this, now finally, I can show you <laughs> here. Huh? Here, there are the apartment in this part here. You see the old bath there dilapidating this small thing. So they said you have to put it there, but you, that's what they said. It has to be beautiful, but it shouldn't be seen. And of course, this is a commission used to reject right away and say, do it yourself, you know. <laughs> but after a while, and it didn't take us so long, we said, somehow if you think about this village and the mountains, this idea of being in the earth and in the mountain, maybe that's not so bad, you know. Maybe we could go into the mountain and all of a sudden some guy in the office comes with this kind of thing there. This is an advertising for the mineral water they make up there. Some uh, guy in California gets really rich with this mineral water in Switzerland <laughs> being from the same source. And they made this advertising, and it says, as you can read here, you know, the, the, the Valley of Falls 80 million years ago. <coughs> so there seems to be this smell of ancient kind of source, water and spring and stone. And as you have seen before in these uh, slides, Falls is one of the villages up there, actually the only one which does have stone slate roofs because normally on the south, the southern part, in the south part of the Alps, you have shingled roofs. And only this place, on the other side of the middle part of the Alp, before Italy comes, or the Italian part of Switzerland, you have this stone stuff. So to us, all of a sudden, we say, yeah, these guys were right. False is something like that, this crude, wild, kind of all the way back kind of thing. So we went on. The next, please. So one guy said, now look at this, you know, if you close your eyes, <laughs> this is some reflection on the, on the water. Huh? And so, I mean, you can, I'm showing you actually the material we had when we started. And maybe you can feel a little bit of the fun we had when we started. And I hope a little bit of this fun and joy stays in this project until the end, I hope. Next, please. So soon after that, we said, OK, this bath is going to be made out of stone. And of course, if you say, and then somebody says, and it's going to be made out of stone, of local stone only. So after a while, you're a little bit shocked you know, by your own courage. <laughs> Because then you say this gray, simple stone, you know, I mean, it's really sort of boring. Huh? Uh, and a whole bath just with this stone. But of course, if you start to look at this stone carefully enough, it's not so boring. You know, all of a sudden you see, you know, what's you, know what you say, yeah, no, it's <laughs> not a bad decision, you know. <laughs> so, you c of course, you could make one mistake if you would take this kind of stone and make a red door, huh, then the whole bath is lost. <laughs> You'll only see this red or blue door and then everything is gone. But if you, if you have the discipline to stick to this, it could work. And I have to admit to you that like almost a year ago, you know, 
we sort of made this real mistake because we really got afraid. And then we said, okay, this false stone in this international age now gets a foreign sister from Italy, you know? And then we introduced an Italian reddish kind of stone. And it took us another two months or three months to come back to our old false stone. So now I can assure you the ball is only made with this stone. Next, please. Then somebody said, think of the possibilities of treating the stone. You can cut the stone, you can saw it, you can drill it, <coughs> you can sand it, you can polish it, you can really polish it. And there is our repertoire. So it's not only the stone <coughs> and all these things you can do with it, but it's also the way you treat it. The next, please. And of course, somebody said, and imagine then when this speci specifically treated stone comes into contact with the water, what we can do with all these things, you know. And somebody said, think of the acoustics, dripping stone in a stone environment, a waterfall, or, and you know all these sounds you can associate with a stone environment. So, of course, as all of you would have said, this bath is becoming for us like an instrument for water in this stone environment. That's what we all say when we start, right? And at the end, <laughs> we have to show, uh, we have to try that it really becomes true. The next, please. <coughs> so, if you think about baths, you know from schools, I don't know your school, maybe you work in a different way, then these old images come to your mind, of course. You work with typologies because we are not the first architects to uh, build a bath, right? So somebody comes with this image and then we said, everything what concerns form in this picture here, you probably know it is this, beautiful Rudaspad in Budapest. I've seen it last year now, finally. It's really beautiful. It's more beautiful than, than the thing we are going to do, I think. <laughs> it's really amazing. Anyway, so we said here, what interests us here, this picture is, of course, as every of you would say, the quality of light in this humid, damp air. Huh? That's it. But as far as building typologies goes, somebody comes up with this other book and says, this is what's interesting you. And this, I must tell you, is maybe the most amazing kind of architecture you can find in my region up there, in these mountains. It expresses this, as we see it, it's a huge kind of thing. You only see maybe a tenth of it or even less. It expresses this kind of forest architecture has to develop to go against the mountain, you know, and go and uh, be in the mountain. It's, the, it's an architecture how nobody ever sees. It's the inside of one of these huge dams. They collect the water. And this actually, this is the inside of the dam above us. If this dam breaks, the bath will be gone, huh? I can tell you. Next one, please. <coughs> so it was sort of like, you feel this, it was sort of like a, a little bit beyond obvious typologies setting out. And here you see actually the one of the first sketches we made where we made the, f uh, the next decision, where we said, okay, we know it's stone and it's water. And then we said, well, what more should we look for, you know? It's gonna be stone blocks in the water. This is our bath. So we went on. Next, please. So there was this really nice phase of, I don't know, I don't remember, was it one day or two weeks, <coughs> when two or three of us made these kind of drawings, you know. And the image we had is in this slope there where we had to build, we opened up a quarry. Huh? So that was nice. We had these charcoal kind of things and opened up the quarry. And it was so easy, you know. When you open up a little bit deeper, water flows in. Huh? And you can imagine the, the, this spring is up there and the water comes out here. So 
And you could be started to imagine, well, this is the quarry. There are, you, we quarried out here in the back. Some other blocks there we remain standing there or whatever. You know. Next, please. After a while, sort of the first uh, sort of function started. The function started to come in a little, just a little, you know. Of course, we had this really precise program in the back of our minds, where this sort of manager, you know, read this the, uh, the jacuzzi and whirlpool and all this kind of stuff. But this didn't interest us too much at the beginning. It maybe. You must know this, it's this phase of the start, which is sort of like naivety, I think. Huh? It's sort of maybe a professional naivety or something, or a naive professionality, <laughs> I don't know. So these things, you see, 35 degrees, 37, we were talking about these cold and warm uh, currents in the back. And there, we always had to draw something coming from there because we knew that the bath is going to be accessed underneath with a tunnel from the old hotel. This was given. And we liked the idea that it's you go into like a mine or something and all of a sudden this stuff appears there. And next please. Same kind of thing, the program we try we are sort of like trying out the program in our quarry. Huh? And it's interesting for me now to read here Whirlpool and all this kind of stuff because now I can tell you there are no Whirlpools. And there are no jacuzzis. There's nothing of that sort in this whole bath, bath. Only later on we found out that we sort of, this being so basic and simple has also affected the whole program. That is, I mean, I have to tell you, there's a renaissance of thermal baths at the moment in Switzerland. And quite close to us, there's a huge one. And this thing <coughs> is full of so-called attractions. You know this? You come in, you open, you pay your 25 francs, and then you see this first kind of thing coming down. You know? But you see the other 15 already. And what happens? You think in order you know, that your money is worthwhile, you have to go to all these things. So, of course, this at the beginning, here you see them all. This, at the moment, is nothing of that sort. We rely on stone and water and on being in different situations on the stone. On the stomach, on the back, going to steps, up, going down, and this kind of stuff. And not make any noise, in uh, any kind of sense noise, I mean. And uh, I'm glad that the people of Fuzz, they sort of believe in that too, you know, <laughs> that it could work. Anyway, this, no, <coughs> you'll see it yourself. The next, please. So we had to go uh, into the next dimension here as architects. So we, the apprentice made these like a hundred cardboard shapes here at random. And so we started to build the mountain and set our blocks and then this we drew up the first plan and then we built it with a model and then for the first time I uh, experienced that I had to change the plan according to perspective. It was, that was sort of nice, you know, there, there was this large board and we set up the plan and there was this one guy here and said, left thinner. <laughs> 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 And the other said, no, a little bit back. And so <laughs> like this, in the back of our minds, of course, was the program and circulation. And at the moment, we still didn't know. We, were sta we, we started to talk, what's this space and what's this space? And we started to find out that maybe today I know a little bit more about these kind of spaces and how they interlock uh, and so on. It's quite as you see by this figure there, it's about five meters high, it's not so small. Uh, and uh, what you immediately see here, the nicest sensation to work with shadow and lights on these uh, blocks here and use them to make your circulation that you have the light and the shadow on the right spaces. This 
It's clear to you how this could be named, huh? Next, please. So after a while, we had to look at our quarry from the top. This is an old first kind of model. And you see this image has a little bit uh, evolved. You see these blocks here, uh, in a way like a giant kind of paved stone path or something, paved with stones. And this stuff here now is uh, covered with this mountain grass. And the, this is a picture of Fals. So you understand why this huge surface of the bath was a problem for us right from the beginning. <coughs> because of it's our main facade, the roof. And uh, it would have been an uh, unbearable kind of idea to have this thing uh, sort of disturbing this kind of meadow coming down from 3,000 meters, you know, all the way down. This, it's called, I don't know how to say it, an extensive kind of, it does have a special name, this kind of pasture here. So this meadow co is coming down and growing on these single huge blocks. In a way, you must know this, or sh sure you know this, you have this natural rock, and sometimes natural rock has this thin layer of grass on it, sort of. So this is the way it's made, transformed into architecture, of course, as we have, uh, but it's this kind of image. The next, please. So we had to find that since we were just carving like children in this uh, slope, after a while we had to, since we're architects and have to do this building at the end, uh, we had to find out some rules of the carving. So this one is an easy one, right? You carve in the slope and here the water collects and you carve in the slope. So he said, and this of course is also possible, it's sort of like a mine, like a, another kind of channel there, this is possible. It's also possible to carve back. I mean, if you look at the plans outside in the exhibition, you see then that what that we did. Maybe this is anxiety, you know, that you have to look for rules and you don't just do it. Maybe it's just Swiss, you know, we have to <laughs> look out for rules in order to dare or something. And the next thing, then something really important happened after a while. We started, if we, like we cut out all these, that okay, okay, according to the rule, we can do this. Then all of a sudden we made one here too, but then we cut out this piece here. <coughs> huh? And here maybe two. And then all of a sudden you see it here. What comes into existence is some sort of like a table, which is called now tables, these huge stone tables. But there at that time they were called gas stations, I must admit. <laughs> uh, so show me the next, please. So that's when they sort of start to come, you know. Here, here it's, it's, they're flying around sort of still. And here you can see how these tables <laughs> come into existence. So this is I actually the basic diagram of all the primer, primary structural moves we make in this path. And I must tell you, I always built these diagrams. I mean, I remember when I was teaching at SciArc Los Angeles, we were talking about like two weeks about the diagram, and then the students would all of a sudden start to do something else, you know. And then I said, yeah, what are you doing now? They said, yeah, well, that was just the diagram. <laughs> so uh, there I saw that some people start with the diagram, and then often they do something else, sort of like doing the homework, and then we do the design. But uh, this here, I'm doing this, I, b I try, I believe in this that this stuff has to follow these rules. The next, please. <coughs> so, of course, here you see them. So, I only show you actual stuff out of that design process. Some of these slides, they are three years old. Some of them are maybe only two months old. They get completed as we go on working. So, this is really old stuff. Uh, and, of course, uh, what you can see here, if we start, if we have these tables and make these cracks upwards to the sky, we get this crack 
and this crack. Simple enough, you know, makes this part light and this part will be in the shadow. How simple and how beautiful. The next, please. So we had this, you know. So here, this is an old thing where we try to find out the rules of the relationship between the plinth, the block, and the tabletop. And you can see the relationship there. It's the rule is every plinth is flush with one of the edges of the tabletop. You see this? I hope, huh? I hope it's correct. <laughs> I think it is, huh? So always this side will be in the light, and this side will be in the light, and this side will be in the light. This giving us the repertoire again to go back into the building and make our circulation and do all the tasks we have to do. So quite simple. Next, please. During the course of this project, we made maybe six models. This might be around the fourth. Always checking out again what's happening and looking at this light stuff where it comes. And of course, we always made them with water because there was always such a nice moment to fill in the water. <laughs> Next, please. <coughs> After a while, uh, you, you, s you saw now we started out with a picture of a whole piece, the quarry, which I really like because I always conceive of a building of one object. I don't know exactly why, but it's just the way I am. I just like it, uh, like a tool or something or a hammer or something. Anyway, and now you see how this all of a sudden becomes tables or stones set and this puzzle of stones. And then, fortunately, after a while, these tables became a hole again. And that was nice because, you, because then you, get, you develop a secondary kind of reading for this building, which is actually like a huge stone block set into, the is set into the slope, artificially set into the slope, and then carved out. Because uh, it's, of course, important that if you start out with these naive kind of ideas, for me, I think at the end it's architecture and not some kind of game, right? But we need these uh, nice open images of the beginning. So the next, please. So there was something else which uh, really was clear right from the beginning that when the water is in, the, in our uh, building or quarry or whatever, it has to be absolutely flush with the floor. Now this is natural. You would all have this idea, but uh, I, let me tell you, just remember these pool details, you know? You know these pool details where they come and go down, then they go up, and then they go down, and overflow, and all this kind of stuff. So this is an important detail for us here. It shows the water level is coming here, and there is an incision in the stone floor where the overflow goes in, and then the floor goes uh, on. And this is our compromise, five centimeters, huh? For the, for the people who have to clean the bath. <laughs> this is uh, five centimeters lower than the rest of the level. Next, please. <coughs> so this is, uh -huh, this is, uh, this is a really old draw drawing, and this is a really new one. This one shows the moment when we and I have to say something, maybe you saw that before. Uh, there was an initial rule of the building, there are not going to be any holes, there are only going to be cracks. And uh, meanwhile, we do have a few holes, but I think they're in the right place. I'm not going to talk about them. But, ba <laughs> but uh, basically, to understand this, now, of course, 
Everybody would do this right from the beginning. You have the indoor pool, the outdoor pool, all the other kind of small pools. And there are these blue lines. The, these are the overflows going from one pool to the next. And these are all these water attractions or whatever, and the sewage system and these channels. So this was clear. It was just an intention. This is the way it's going to be. And then somebody t took the wrong color, uh, just the next attempt, and said, of course. And there is this system, this net of fissures or something on the ceiling. Huh? The light penetrating into the bath. And of course, that's what this drawing uh, sort of shows, this pattern of the roof and this pattern of the floor is not going to be the same. We've got to work really hard to find justification that is justifications that it's going to be different. And <coughs> so this is one of the last drawings of the floor I made a couple of months ago to test the cracks in the floors. And when I'm right, yeah, you see the blue ones are now overflows and expansion joints and stuff like that. And the yellow ones, uh, no, the yellow ones are expansion joints of the engineer he needed. And only the ones which are only red are our formal architectural cracks in the floor. But don't, you won't see it then, you know, the afterwards. But it's sort the of kind of a discipline we like that we try to integrate then all these professional aspects into this building so that I hope nobody can come and tell us, yeah, here you made this formal decision, you know, it could be here or it could be here, it's just here because it's nice or something. Because I don't like that. I like when buildings have these many, many, many layers of justification. Call it Swiss, I like it. <laughs> Next, please. So another way of controlling these blocks was talking about these spaces here and how they interlock from one to another. I'm not going to bore you with this because you can almost see what's what we have been trying there. The name it had here was the zipper, huh? This kind of <laughs> uh, space in here. And <coughs> You realize that probably already that the whole bath consists of this one continuous space which meanders through the whole building and makes it a whole. And this principle here is the, I don't know how to say this in English, we call it the uh, Windrad or the Windmühle, this windmill principle. Huh? And out of this windmill principle, of course, you could make whole carpets. Huh? So there are a couple of these principles we worked with in order to rule the, the, the floor plan and the blocks. Next, please. Here you see it again. And of course, you can look at these drawings. It was always interesting to look at these drawings as blocks. And if you look at the weight of the blocks and the more weight in the back and less in the front and how they sit, but then Naturally, you can close your eyes and all of a sudden you look at the space in between. And then uh, uh, th you can start to develop the rules. Or oh, this, a simple one. I, on this uh, floor plan pattern, <coughs> every line which is yellow on, on the blocks is, uh, is there many times. And only the ones which don't have yellow are single lines in the whole floor plan. I'm not talking about Mondrian and all these guys, but I think they had similar problems to organize fields and stuff like that. And it was interesting. We made stuff like this several times. All of a sudden, when you change the plan according to this, and you look at both of them, all of a sudden there's sort of like this movement of position or something. Like a kaleidoscope, you shake it once more, and all of a sudden you think, yeah, but it's better. And we try to be honest with these things, you know, to really compare both of it. Next, please. <coughs> Another thing of ordering was, of course, uh, like being conscious about the spatial sequences. So this was. This shows the way coming from the tunnel 
and then you have to go here, then you go here, then you turn around, then here, back here. This I have to tell you, because this is nice. Because if you go there, <laughs> be careful not to miss it. Uh, back here, you're like a civilian. Huh? Then we look like we look. And then you go into these dark spaces there. And when you come out on this band on the rock on the other side, on the other side, you're the false bathing client, naked with skin, you know, and you stand there. Uh, and this is deliberately made that you make this difference, like it's yeah, that you make this difference from being in this bath and having this feeling of stone and skin and all this kind of stuff. Huh? So this is actually showing the way until you stand somewhere there. Huh? And see for the first time up here, in front of these five doors, you see for the first time, you see this sort of landscape or whatever you would call it, of the bath. And this I can only tell you, I won't bore you with that. We have, tr have tried to be really careful about these sequences and that we don't have to put up any uh, direction marks, or any arrows or something, you know, so that the in all these spaces this is wider and this is even narrower so that there won't be, it would be clear where you have to go or maybe back there you'll see the light and so on. Everything you would do also, we did. Okay, the next please. So, of course, you have realized a long time ago that these huge blocks by 11 by 5 meters and these tremendous <coughs> things, they're not going to be made out of solid, false stone, you know? Even though at the first meeting, at the community meeting, the people up there, they asked me, and what's this there? Then I said, we don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> they were afraid of the cost, you know, and transporting all this. <laughs> So, of course, it was always clear at the end. We're gonna, this is actually the first drawing that we made. We said, of course, then we're going to hollow out all these single blocks. And in the <coughs> background of, a of our mind, we had all these parts of the programs which asked for small functions and for privacy and for all this stuff. So, here we were talking, how are we going to make this, you know, and we said, yeah, it'd be nice to just have one opening, and if they're too open, they sort of, all these obvious things you have to, can say. And this is the way they're made now. The whole bath, in every block, every block will have always, oh, can you help me? Thank you. There's always the same door in the stone. I you might see one in the hallway now down there. It's always the same door uh, where you get into the block. So if you, in architectural terms, this is nice, huh? In architectural terms, now you can say we have two kinds of spaces. This continuous kind of big space and this small enclosed space within the thing. So at the end, huh? So if you go into <coughs> these things, uh, maybe I show in a big plan, or maybe you can read it outside. There are uh, different things happening in there. Next, please. And this is an, uh, some old drawings. Here, you see into the fire bath, it's called. This is nice, these blocks, they assume names by the people working with them after a while. Because the starting point here, it's rusty water, as the old water of Fals is. <coughs> if it comes to the air, there is this oxygen kind of reaction. And then it turns red. And this is going to be red, but the cantonal chemist is against it. So he, you know, don't tell anybody. <laughs> uh, because it's not healthy. <laughs> huh? You know what I mean? Rust coming out from 5,000 meters. <laughs> It's not healthy, huh? Uh, so this is 42 degrees. We assume that only Japanese people will go into it. In the <laughs> <laughs> because they're used to up to 45, so they tell me. 
Uh, and this, naturally enough, <coughs> is the cold bath. This is original false temperature of 12 degrees, you know? So you'll never find me in there. <laughs> <laughs> the next, please. Okay, fire bath, cold bath, shower, stone. Uh, it, here is some between these blocks there. Yeah, I'll tell you a few attractions, so you might want to go there and pay, pay these 25 francs, you know? <laughs> because the village community of Fuzz needs some entrances there. Uh, if you go down there, you, go, you have to swim into this block, and the water will be, if you stand in the water up the hill, right? There will be this entrance just a little bit above your head and really narrow. So you have to go these two meters back and then you hit this tall space there <coughs> like that. and this tall space will be dark and the water will be bubbling because on the uh <laughs> <laughs> don't laugh at me <laughs> there has to be some fun you know? <laughs> on the floor you'll see these six brass uh, openings the hoses and there the water is uh, driven into this uh, small pool and next to it, you'll see four bright beams or something. So you can imagine, since the surface of the water does have these bubbles, right? And the light comes from underneath. So you get this disco kind of light <laughs> <laughs> in there. <laughs> so this is maybe this is important. My, my <coughs> young architect in the office, when I came up with the, this idea, he said, now you're crazy, you know? Are we making this is, but I think it's also a bath for the people. And sometimes, if you make all these strict rules, you know, it's nice to do something against them, you know. Right? And it's made in a way that you can see where the water comes from. It's not a natural waterfall. There's nothing of imitating nature. It's still technical. The whole bath is technical. There's nothing uh, of that sort. But still, that's happening in here, huh? Or if you go in, that's a nice one too, if you go into here, it's called sounding stone. So if you go into here, there is this uh, contemporary composer of Switzerland, of contemporary music, composing this stone music with real stone. It's purely electronic, it's sort of something like John Cage kind of thing. So this actually is a plywood kind of um, lounge chair or something. You can lie into this stone and hear this uh, generated music, right? So the project manager always wants to make a green and red light <laughs> in front of this thing because he thinks so many people want to go there. I don't know. <laughs> 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 this is the flower bath. There are restaurants and so on. You can see it in the exhibition what's happening here. But it's a little bit of fun, huh? Next, please. Yeah, this is the uh, one drawing of, yeah, this is the last one I'm showing. The old this is our version of this old classical drinking fountain in the old spas, you know, this marble kind of thing. And you come, and then this plaquette saying you, the water comes from five million years ago and doesn't have all these chemicals and it's really healthy for you. So this is happening in here too. You, there somewhere will be this plaquette of the false water, but I must tell you it's the same water you can have from the water tap, you know, <laughs> <laughs> somehow. <laughs> but you walk into this, as all the blocks, the inside of the blocks are made always in the same, the door, and a really low depressed part in stone and then it opens up. And here, the same thing. Here, a person would stand. There's a huge, simple brass pipe. And the water, this healthy water, comes and falls down into this thing. And it will be nice in this stone environment. I look forward to this moment. We have to design two <coughs> glass shelves, right? One glass and another glass. You put the drinking glasses there. So this is one of the last things we have to make in, in this kind of thing. Next, please. When you saw the idea, it's the idea of like walking into a fountain, the fountain <coughs> being bigger than you are. We hope, I hope it works. Let's see. 
Yeah, that's another one. Next one, please. This is a big one. This is the shower stone. And this, the inside is completely black. And I tested it now. I mean, I have to tell you something else. This acoustic stuff, you know this. If you, you can do any building you want and you go to the acoustical engineer and then he'll tell you reverberation time between 1.8 and maximum 2, you know. If you sing Greg Gregorian chants, it could be 2.2 maybe. Uh, so what this amounts to, to me, in my opinion, is that all buildings sound the same. Huh? So what our uh, opinion here is that this bath is allowed to have its sound. Nobody knows what this sound is. It's much too complicated to figure out. I ask people. You know, everybody would say, yeah, you would have to make models for years and years, one to ten, in order to find out. And the end would always be that the acoustical engineer would tell you to put these silly things on the ceiling, you know them? <laughs> these, these holes. <laughs> so I convinced the people from, of Fallis that this bath is allowed to sound the way it sounds. So I tested this guy, you know. <laughs> I tested this guy. And this does have the sound which would be good for a choir for men, you know. <laughs> and it's, it's, uh, so I think this, we're gonna, we, we can leave, you know. It's the first one which works. And this one here, this is one of the restrooms. This one doesn't work. So ask me afterwards what we're going to do here. Because this is really, it's not a nice sound in here. The first one is finished. But something works in here. Huh? This here. You have these small uh, thing, uh, these uh, lying chairs here. And there you have this small opening where only when you lie down on this chair, you can see out. And then you see out, of course that's the reason why they're black, you know. So when you look out, you have one of these incredible meadows on the opposite side of the, uh, of the hill, right? And see, so you have like your private color TV over there. <laughs> so it's nice. Just lately, last week, I heard somebody say, oh, this room with this false window. So it already has a name. Also, I like this kind of stuff when it becomes part of it. Next, please. <coughs> There's a level down here. I mean, this is where you enter. This is in here. You change from a civilian to a nice uh, bathing guest. Huh? You stand here, indoor pool, and so on, and so on. Uh, but down here, you can have all these nice treatments like massage and stuff. There's actually this uh, more traditional kind of therapy level down here. That's down here. Made in the same kind of principle. Next, please. This is actually uh, out of a series of control, control plans. Since we work with this silly computer uh, and the CAD stuff, we had the possibility to take the working drawings and eliminate all the lines out of what for all these details and indications and measurements and just print out the pure things in order to see whether now, two years later, we still have the, didn't lose the basic idea, you know. So whether this pattern and everything is still there, this is showing the ceiling cracks and this is showing the floor cracks and so on. Next, please. And this is the model, the stone model of the false stone we made two years ago, or at the right at the beginning, for the community of Falls. And then we stopped with these cardboard models because I always think it's so nice to work with the real material when you work with the model so that you get some information of what you're working on and you don't have this dollhouse kind of cardboard and so on but there is sort of like a smell of what you're trying to do. And that, at that time, we were really pleased, you know, when this sort of, 
light, water, stone kind of thing started to come into existence. Um, also the people, the community of Fuzz, I think they were quite pleased too because they voted with over 90%. All these people, you know, f of the whole population, they voted for this kind of investment. Next, please. Next, please. Next, please. <coughs> Next, please. Thank you. There are going to be a few questions. Are you sure? I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> are you really sure? <laughs> Who's going to start? Are you thirsty? Excuse me. Can you hold on one second? Sorry, Joel. Do we have the microphone or whoever is doing? Can you switch it on to somebody? Is it switch on? No. It doesn't work, huh? No, it doesn't work. So you have to speak. Speak louder. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't hear the question in the back, so I'll just repeat it as best I can. The question was referring to the graphic techniques quote unquote, that Peter uses, and the similarities to the Nolly plan of Rome that you probably know from 1748, and uh, whether there is this, this question of the, the white on black and black on white, uh, whether you can talk about this, this similarity or possible similarity. I don't know these plants, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, it, stuff like this, I think, comes out of what you have to do. If we decide to open up a quarry, you know, then we look for the next pencil which would do that for us. So it's not, in this, at this stage, it, it's not uh, dealing with a lot. Actually, I sort of hate dealing with all these things which have been done because Sometimes they're really good, and if I would study everything, I would never do anything, you know. So, for the, when I work, I, it's sort of more direct, straightforward. You know? I'm sorry about that. Single, say it again. You need to translate. Can you, can you say what is your single most favorite thing about this project? And Did why? you hear that in the back? No, the question is, given the way that, that Peter was describing a number of things in terms of his own personal uh, personal. likes and dislikes of how he liked to work, whether he could point out the, most, the, the single most favorite part of the project. If I think about the building, you know, in terms of nice corners or nice elements, I couldn't give you an answer, but I can give you another answer. When they started to build it, and we developed this kind of, uh, we had these great big problems, how are these walls going to be, right? And we started out with blocks like this, I went to the quarry and saw these huge blocks, but according to our imagination, these blocks were ridiculously small, huh? 
So there were these small things. So we didn't know what to do. So in this quarry, this guy usually makes these stones for the slate roofs. And as always, there were piles and piles of these stacks of these things there. So I saw them, and all of a sudden I saw them, I said, hey, I think this is it, you know. This kind of thing. This is what I like, you know. You think so much about something, and you have all these ideas, and all of a sudden you, see <laughs> you don't know how you're sort of like lucky. Huh? This is like, if you ask me what's my favorite thing, this uh, comes to my mind. Or another thing, I go to the construction site and see this now, and I'm sort of shocked. I think this god damn looks, thing looks more precise and more uh, heavy and sharp than we ever imagined it. You know, it's incredible, this sort of thing. So I went home to the office and said, hey, boys, this is a fascistic building. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, we have to talk about, I mean, this is... <laughs> <laughs> So, as a building, you know, I couldn't tell you. This is a whole thing. But uh, so, it's sort of, uh, yeah. It doesn't answer your question, I know. <laughs> Where are all the questions coming from that side? How, how do you see the, the building with lots of people in it? Because you didn't sort of, it looked like maybe there was only one person in it, or, and it was like a secret place where you could be. <coughs> question is how would Peter see it with lots of the, the project with lots of people in it it seems that it's somehow melancholic or there's yeah. one person in the picture how would how do you see it with lots of people? lots of lots of people why do you say that one t would you imagine me as an architect to draw a lot of people <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Just, I just oh, do, do you feel I want to get the feel oh. of yeah. your feeling for I mean in a way you're right I mean my favorite time would not be Friday at four o'clock in the winter, <laughs> you know? <laughs> because then these people come back from skiing, go to the hotel and then they take a swim before they go for dinner. And then I think it's really going to be crowded. Uh, but maybe it doesn't matter. I don't know. I mean, I, if I look at this, I think it would be nice and there are five people and there are five people, nice distance, you know? Uh, <laughs> But you can sort of go into the water and back. It's not a sports bath and you stuff like that. But I hope it also works when there are too many people in it. And what they we counted actually, we once did this on this plan made a dot, you know, where somebody could be undisturbed. And we came to 140 places. So I don't know. But I hope it's not, I don't think it's melancholy. Do you think it's melancholy? Mm. I used that word. I didn't say anything. Oh, ah, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> places like Stonehenge. And then there is, at least the model did to me. Um, and at the other end, there is a question about construction, which is that you, by necessity, have to actually build this building with small elements. And the question in my mind, and I'm not sure I have formulated, formulated this correctly, is how actually you bring this search for thingness or whatever it is on the one hand and on the other um, another about construction and making things to look like um, something which may be more massive than it, in, than it is in real life. So you're telling me that this would look more massive than it is. So 
I tell you how it's constructed. It's constructed not with these blocks, as I said before, but with long layers of stone. And it's the same effect as you have in a piece of cloth or carpet, that if you can't make something big enough with your elements as an architect, take small elements and add them, and they make a tex texture for you. And if you know this region up there, you'll find this strata of thing in every, in every uh, wall there. It's actually, there's a name for it. And I t always test this stuff sort of on the building side. When the workers on the building side start to, s when they see it also, then I think I could I'm right because I don't like, you know, an architect staying at the entrance door and explaining everything, you know. So this, I think, works nice. And this what struck me when I really saw it when it was built that it really works. So <coughs> let me say, in the whole bath, everything is structural. Huh? There's no clad piece of anything. There's no ceramics. There is no clad piece of stone. It's not a steel frame kind of thing, and then you know this, and all these airs and stainless steel kind of uh, fixtures and uh, nothing of that sort. It's actually made like old retaining walls. These old retaining walls they made about 50 years ago. That's the way we do it. We build 50 centimeters high of wall, and the back side of this wall is sort of like this, goes like this. One side is flush, the other side goes like this. Then we set the molding, or concrete molding, no scuff. You know what I mean, huh? Anyway, put the concrete in, reinforce concrete, the next 50 centimeters, next 50 centimeters. That's the way it's built. So this is a compound kind of stone concrete thing, which answers the question of uh, something being phony or just, you know, doing as if or something. But then we had to integrate, this is interesting then, you know, in your kind of critical question. The whole technique of the bath, the bath needs, like all these expansion joints and everything and everything, they're partly visible in these crack systems and partly they're worked into the structural mass of the building, like insulations and, and waterproofing and all kinds of things. If you're inside of the bath, you have this, an architect knows, you know, you have this kind of floor, the pool, and the pool is heavy and the water goes down, the pool comes up, the pool goes down, all these kind of technical problems. You open a single glass door and the pavement goes <coughs> You know, it's always the same, like chiseled out of stone. But the architect will know, uh, now, the whole structure of the floor changed. All of a sudden, you're in an outside kind of flat roof, walkable kind of situation. So people who know these kind of problems, you know, they, with them I would like to talk, is this correct what we're doing? I think it is. And in this way, it's really advanced as hell, in a way. But it's structural. <coughs> I don't know. But this answers your question. It's a question at the back there. <coughs> yeah, I o work all the, the question time. is that at the end, Peter said that had the slide that said, <laughs> "Life is important, not design," and uh, the person needs clarification. <laughs> 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 You really want me to answer? <laughs> you know what I mean. You, know. you don't know what I mean. <laughs> you always, see, you always work and work and work. And if you, you must know this, if you're an architect and if you do this work, it's like uh, 24 hours. You can't do a building without this kind of, Everybody knows, all architects are like that. And sometimes it's good, good to, I think it's good to see that this is not everything. You know, this architecture kind of stuff, you know. That's why I think we should go and have a beer now. <laughs> <laughs>